So I'm sure you would have been hearing about something like paradigm uh, study, actually. So it has been there has been a big shift as well, especially with the introduction of uh, these kind of newer drugs. So we will try to focus on those drugs, the new drug. So the first question always comes is, what is heart failure? Why is it so complex? You know, what is the problem basically with this? You know, why are we so much worried about it? So the problem is, as we all know, a lot of times it can be confused with COPD or, you know, due to its symptoms like the dyspnea, fatigue, pulmonary congestion or peripheral edema as well. So if maybe someone may think even like, okay, someone is having some kidney problem, or someone is having just a heart problem. So we may be neglecting the heart failure as an entity. And it is a leading cause of morbidity and also mortality as well. So what happens is due to time when the patient has been uh, suffering from all these problems, so the patient starts having enlargement of the left ventricle and there's de decline in the ejection fraction. And yes, some patients, of course, it happens as initial moments, they may not be having any symptoms for that. So there are a large range of terms which are used to describe the heart failure, like acute heart failure, chronic heart failure, the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or with reduced ejection fraction. So what are its meaning? What does it mean, those technical terms actually? What does it mean? For example, chronic heart failure, you will be calling it as when someone is having those acute episodes with stable or worsening or even decompensation as well. Acute episodes are those episodes in which a patient needs, has to go a specialized center like a hospital and need some emergency treatment as well. And then comes the heart failure entity with reduced ejection fraction. Reduced ejection fraction means less than 40 and preserved ejection fraction means more than 50 uh, percent as well. Now coming to the pathophysiology. So what happens in the pathophysiology? So what is happening is there is damage to the cardiac myocytes and extracellular matrix liquids leads which leads to the changes in the shape, function and of course the size of the heart as well and for finally it tends to also alter the cardiac wall stress. On an overall basis, so all these changes whatever is happening, they will be leading to systemic neurohormonal overactivation which leads to vasoconstriction, fibrosis, apoptosis, hypertrophy, cellular alterations or even on the molecular basis as well and patient may also be seen associated with myotoxicity of the myocardium in fact due to which a lot of remodeling which is maladaptive is happening and there's progressive worsening of the left ventricular ejection fraction due to which patient may be coming up with symptoms of dyspnea, edema, fatigue, which finally leads to arrhythmias, morbidity, and finally mortality as well. So once we know what is the basic mechanism, so what is happening is due to during all these times, there are a lot of plenty of clinical studies which has shown that there's overactivation of the RAS system and due to which all these changes are happening. Again, after one hour. Then what is happening is, so there are three changes which is happening. On the One is on the level of natriuretic peptide system. Then on the level of RAS and also the sympathetic nervous system as well. Due to the activation of sympathetic nervous system, what is happening is there is vasoconstriction. Okay. And... The vasoconstriction also happens due to the RAS activation, overactivation, I would say. Not just activation, but overactivation. See, our body is a great, um, much more than even supercomputer as well. So, in why supercomputer? In the sense because it has got really very good compensatory mechanism, which can be there for a long, long time. And not just that, so what happens is, the vasodilatation and the vasoconstriction tends to have a big play for that as well. 
And then what happens is, you must be able to, first of all, if a heart failure patient comes to you, so what you should be able to do is, you should be able to classify this severity of the heart failure. So what are the classes in which you classify? There are four classes in which you classify. So class one means is, there's no limitation of the physical activity. Okay, so the ordinary physical activity does not cause any undue breathlessness, fatigue, or even palpitations. Similarly, class two, what happens is, there's slight limitation of the physical activity. So the patient will be comfortable at rest, but ordinary physical activity results in a little bit of breathlessness or maybe even fatigue or palpitations as well. So class three on a uh, simple words, you can say it all as well is, the patient tends to have moderate symptoms, okay? So there's marked limitation of those physical activity. Patient may be comfortable at rest, but less than ordinary physical activity tends to result in the undue breathlessness. Similarly, in class 4, what happens is the patient is so symptomatic, is not even able to do any physical activity. And patient will be having problems even while taking rest. The patient is lying down on a bed and still he is complaining of the problems. So that's what you see. As you all know, so this is definitely heart failure is a progressive entity with very high mortality and as we all know initially what happens is the acute episodes are there but over a uh, longer time gap but later on what happens is those acute episodes the interval between them tends to start decreasing and that's where the disease starts progressing as well due to which there's functional uh, just a second okay so due to which what will happen is the function and quality of life will start to come down and the mortality will start to raise so what are the pharmacotherapies so other than this which is which you are seeing over here what are the other management things do you know what are the other drugs <coughs> can you, you can use the chat box you have almost two minutes okay so you can use the chat box so what are the drugs which is being used So what are the drugs? I had already given you all a hint. So what was what was the drug which was used in the uh, which came as a result of paradigm study? I hope you all are seeing those heart failure patients in your day to day life as well. So you, we all know about, you know, these standard therapies like the vasodilators, which are always the initial introductory therapy. Later on, the ACE inhibitor or the ARBs are the ones which is used. And you have to add up the beta blockers, the diuretics or MRAs, and also the novel inotropic agents as well. And patient may need sometimes these devices or even heart transplantations. So now let's go back to the history. So what are those landmark trials, especially for patient with reduced ejection fraction? So one of the earliest study which came was called as SOLT study, which came in almost 19, early 1990s. It showed that inalapril, like the ACE inhibitors, they have a big role for the management of such kind of patients. And then of course, the study was uh, in 1999, which showed the B key benefit of the bisoprolol. So bisoprolol has a much uh, better effect when you try to compare with a placebo for the morbidity and also the mortality benefits, in fact, as well. And later on was charm alternative, which came for the benefits of the candesartan. Candesartan was an angiotensin receptor blocker. 
and then was finally charm added study so in which they tried to show the key benefits of candice harton versus placebo as well and this was also one of the studies as well which has shown significant reduction in the morbidity and the mortality and for the shift study there was key benefits of evil bread in so, so these are some of those so each and every study was bringing out some of the new pharmacological uh, agents which have a good uh, satisfaction i would say a positive effect on helping the, uh, the patients not just the patients but also i would say also the society as well so then came the emphasis heart failure study as well which proved the key benefit of epilirinone okay which was a mra and as we all will know the one of the uh, the percentage reduction was almost 37 percent 37 percent is a very huge uh, number actually okay and then came the paradigm heart failure study so paradigm heart failure what did it show it was a molecule which was lcz696 okay so what is it it is a army what is full form of army and it they tried to have a head-on study with inalapril so what it shows was even compared to the inalapril as well it has a, a decreased cardiovascular mortality and also betters the <clears throat> heart failure hospitalization rate as well so there has been a lot of <clears throat> other studies as well so what it shows as well is uh, as you can see beautifully in this slide so they we are trying to use the other molecules which try to show beneficial so especially regarding the ace inhibitors so what were those ace inhibitors and what are those studies which were being used for the benefits of the heart failure patients then came the arbs for the arbs as well so there has been a lot of different studies which has been trying to prove up the benefits of losartan valsartan candesartan or the low sergeant itself as well and then came for the beta blockers so for the beta blockers as well so what were those beta blockers which were really helpful for example bisoprolol metoprolol or carvedilol as well and if we look at carvedilol why so what happens now with carvedilol it is very significant it is almost like 35 percent 35 percent relative risk reduction okay dose and uh, but yes uh, one of its problem you can think is yeah you have to give like BD dosage otherwise nowadays there are extended release formulations as well which which you can give is like only just uh, once daily itself okay or metoprolol or bisoprolol as well you have to give only once daily so but although with for carfidilol as you can see there are a lot of studies as well in fact uh, so one of the comet study i would really like to quote so comet study was special in the sense they tried to compare carvedilol up to 25 milligram bd versus metoprolol up to 50 milligram bd and when they tried to compare that there was almost 20 percent relative risk reduction okay so now coming to those other studies about like the rails mfs or emphasis study so what they used was mra inhibitors so mra inhibitors what were the ones like spironolactone epilirinone and then emphasis was one of the really important studies in which the, um, the epilirinone showed a relative risk reduction of almost 37 percent it's a very huge number okay so now we all have been uh, knowing so what happens is yes uh, with time the survival rate for the chronic heart failure patient with reduced ejection fraction has improved however the mortality still tends to remain high so survival rates are improving but mortality remain, uh, rates are remaining high so what can we do for those mortality rates how can we try to you know uh, tackle them so 
so as we all know so what is really happening is if for people aged more than 40 years almost 20 percent of the people will develop heart failure in their lifetime and in fact it is a very rapidly growing cardiovascular condition and which is being primarily driven by deteriorating lifestyles and aging population and then what is happening is the heart failure significantly increases mortality and then what happens is almost 50 percent of the patients will die within five years of diagnosis in fact and even if they get admitted the in hospital death rate ranges from two to seven percent in fact so even if you hospitalize such kind of patients it's not like this that the patients are not going to die they still do have a very significant uh, rate for these kind of patients so that is what you need to be really careful and we need to be aware as well and if we try to talk about the gender bias in fact for females if a female patient is hospitalized for the heart failure the only survival rate is almost 1.7 years so which is very low at least men have a little bit bigger survival rate for that now coming to the what are those newer advances in heart failure management so what are those newer drugs if a bred in yes then the ARNI inhibitors so what is ARNI inhibitors which I said it ARNI stands for angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor angiotensin ARNI angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor on ARNI okay and then also intravenous iron as well so it has a big role especially in terms of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction so it was shown in confirmed heart failure trial so what happens with the Evabradin? So Evabradin actually is a funny current inhibitor and it is indicated to reduce the risk of hospitalization for worsening heart failure in patients with stable, symptomatic, chronic heart failure with an injection fraction of 35% or lower or especially the patients who are in sinus rhythm with resting heart rate of more than 70 or more than that. Similarly, who are either on maximally tolerated doses of beta blockers or have a contraindication to beta blocker use. And this drug blocks the hyperpolarization activated cyclic nucleotide ketid channel responsible for the cardiac pacemaker, which is also called as the funny current that regulates the heart rate without any effect on vascular repolarization. So what was initially shown in the SHIFT trial was when a patient is symptomatic with left ventricular ejection fraction less than 35% and one of the groups, almost 3,270 patients was receiving Evabradin 7.5 milligram BD. So what it showed was it significantly reduced the major risk associated with heart failure versus placebo. So we already know about this uh, flow chart so what is happening is the natriuretic peptides have a potential beneficial effect actions in the heart failure so what is those beneficial actions is it not only decreases the sympathetic flow the vasopressin and also decreases the salt appetite and water intake but also decreases the hypertrophy or decreases the fibroblast proliferation in fact and increases the sodium or water loss and also decreases the aldosterone and renin wise as well and then finally what happens is whenever these uh, this is there so it will also cause the vasodilatation vasodilatation what is the mechanism for vasodilatation we also need to understand the physiology which is associated with this so there is decreased systemic vascular resistance also decreased pulmonary artery pressure and decreased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure as well and also finally decreased right atrial pressure as well so what happens is the natriuretic peptides they get cleared and also degraded by the enzymes called as protease and neprilysin in fact so then what happens is whenever you are giving the NEPs, 
they get inhibited and have to be associated with the RAS blockade. So what will happen is all of those effects of the angiotensinogen, you know, they get converted into angiotensin 1, 2, uh, you know, so they are the ones which will be causing the hypertrophic fibrosis and also even the peripheral vessels, it will lead to vasoconstriction, the hypertrophy and also in the kidneys, they will be causing the sodium or water retention in fact. And finally, when they act on the brain, that is when the norepinephrine release will happen, which leads to higher sympathetic tone. So, when you try to uh, see the evolution of angiotensin neprilysin inhibition, so what happens is neprilysin inhibition alone tends to cause, in can be ineffective due to angiotensin activation which will lead to neprilysin inhibition plus ACE inhibition, which leads to further potentially dangerous due to the angioedema. Finally, when there is neprilysin inhibition plus also angiotensin receptor blockade. So this is the first uh, ARNI, which is angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor was LCZ696. Okay. So this is like a novel drug. So what was happening is it causes two things. So what are those two things is? First thing is simultaneous neprilysin inhibition and also the angiotensin receptor blockade. So, so this is a salt complex which tends to com contain two active components and one is to one molar ratio. So it contains these two things and what are those two things is? One is a succubitril, so which is a further as a prodrug actually. So, which will get metabolized into the neprilysin inhibitor. And also the other one is valsartan. Valsartan is an angiotensin 1 receptor blocker. So, what is going to happen is, as I said it, so this is what happens. LCZ696 contains two molecules. One is a valsartan and also a prodrug for the succubitril. So, which gets further into, which is the NEP inhibitor. And that's how you get those beneficial effects as well. For whichever patients you are trying to use. So I have been talking quite a lot to you about the paradigm heart failure study. So what was paradigm heart failure? So this was the first study which tried to see or test the effect of LCZ696 on morbidity and also mortality in the patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. It normally tends to primarily evaluate whether simultaneous angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibition with LCZ696 compared with inalapril in addition to conventional heart failure treatment. It delays time to first occurrence of either cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization. Determine and also in the study as well, it aimed at determining the place of ARNI LCZ696 as an alternative to ACE inhibitor in patients with chronic systolic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And inalapril is the only ACE inhibitor which has shown to reduce the mortality in a broad spectrum of heart failure patients with reduced ejection fraction. So the trial which was used was solved T trial. So as we all can see, so what was happening is LCZ 696, 200 milligrams BD was being given compared to inalapril 10 mg BD. So what were the inclusion criteria? If you can see the slides very well. So the inclusion criteria were chronic heart failure patients who were in functional status of 2 to 4 with reduced ejection fraction less than 40% and the BNP levels were more than 150 or even higher in fact especially which has been there at least more than 100 in the past one year and when the patient has had already been a stable treatment with ACE inhibitor or an ARB and a beta blocker as well and aldosterone antagonists should be considered for all patients the treatment of a stable dosage of more than four weeks if it was being given. 
there were like all the clinical trials it has its own some of the exclusion criteria as well like any hypersensitivity compromised uh, renal function hyperkalemia and uh, very symptomatic hypertension or decompensation as well for the heart failure and in the safety wise you had to try to monitor them these patients on serious adverse effects like the hyperkalemia symptomatic hypertension serum creatinine angioedema and other side effects as well so when they try to compare the baseline characteristics for both the groups they were almost similar so no significant difference was seen for this patient so now coming to the results so what are the results which you can see it over here what do you notice what do you notice in this so what do you notice in this patient so what happens is so you have to try to see is there's a significant difference in the death from the cardiovascular cause or even the ha first hospitalization so in this new molecule so what was happening is there is a significant benefit when you try to compare it with the uh, inalapril and even when you try to see for the death as well so what has happened is the death rate has also more than 20% reduction is there similarly when you see about the first hospitalization rate for this unique combination it has gone 21% down and death from any cause went down by almost 16% and even when you try to see about the hypertension yes it had happened but it is uh, it was associated in the uh, such kind of patients but not even too much it is there yes you need to be slightly careful about the hyperkalemia as well but you need to just keep an eye as well for that so the primary outcomes as you already saw in these slides there was 20% reduction in the cardiovascular death also 20% reduction in the cardiovascular mortality and further 21% reduction in the heart failure hospitalization as well so on an overall basis there was no protocol defined decline in renal function there was no difference in the new onset atrial fibrillation okay so and when we try to see even the mortality benefit as well with this new molecule which was lcz696 the arni inhibitor angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor as well it was significantly different and much better and that is one of the reasons it got incorporated in the 2016 acc aha guidelines for the heart failure uh, and also the 2016 ESC guidelines for the diagnosis and treatment of acute and chronic heart failure. It was included as a class one. Class of recommendation was one, in fact. So, it can be recommended as a uh, replacement for ACE inhibitor for further reduction in the risk of the heart failure hospitalization and also death in the ambulatory patients now once we know about where to use what we should also know what about what are the conditions in which you should not be able to use it as well so what are those contraindications so some of the contraindications includes is if a patient is hypersensitive to any of the components uh, and if the patient has any history of any angioedema if for example when the patient has been already on therapies of ACE inhibitors or ARBs as well and the patient has so for those kind of patient you should not use it similarly if the patient is already on a ACE inhibitor you should wait at least for 36 hours before switching to this medication now once you know about this molecule as well what are the other things which you have to be careful I think I have come across a lot of times uh, those patients of heart failure are also having those uh, anemia as well 
a lot of times I come across that uh, the physicians tend to write us oral iron replacement or therapies but what has happened is clearly it has been shown that intravenous should be a much preferred strategy so this was another uh, study as well in which they had tried to see was when uh, the serum fer ferritin is less than 100 microgram per liter or this ferritin concentration is between 100 to 299 microgram per liter the transferrin saturation was less than 20 percent then this should be preferred after three days after three days. so then what happens is uh, other than that if you want to really try to see uh, in the algorithm as well so how do you manage those iron deficiency uh, treatment so for example so what you can do is uh, for this uh, yeah there has been two clinical trials for this confirmed heart failure as well the fair heart failure as well in the confirmed heart failure said it the fcm can be used in 1000 to 200 2000 milligrams it can be given in terms of single or also multiple dosage of 15 500 to 1000 milligrams of uh, corrected iron deficiency and that when a patient comes for follow-up so what are you going to check then anyone so you should try to check for the ferritin levels so that's how you'll be doing or the TSAT as well okay and you have to keep on advising them so but in the next time when the patient comes so you can give them like 500 milligram itself so you do not give really the high dose which you had given in the first time visit so are you all having any questions so far so we'll be having some more sessions as well on this uh, related topic and I would really advise you to uh, you can always ask your questions as well feel free to write them to me uh, and uh, we can discuss these questions even in any of these sessions so I hope uh, there are no questions so far at all and uh, if there are no questions we will stop the session for today <laughs>